Big Tent is an inclusive coalition of concerned citizens, and we're working for positive change in America. We're nonpartisan. We value effective governance, decent, truthful leadership, and solutions-oriented outlook. Uh, we believe in democratic ideals, and we're working on current issues like gun violence protection, health care, environment. Um, and we very carefully uh, curate and have wonderful talks. So we also communicate with each other, give, our, give ourselves a forum to get to know each other and share ideas. So thank you for being here. Don't forget to look at the website and help us with letter writing and everything else. Now I'm going to turn it over to Emily Power, who's going to introduce our speaker. Thank you, Karen. Um, we are so, so honored and lucky today to have Judd Legum, founder of the Popular Information Newsletter with us. Judd is an attorney who was the research director for Hillary Clinton's 2008 presidential campaign. He spent a decade obsessively following politics as the founder and editor of Think Progress, a progressive media outlet that reached 40 million people per month. Judd founded Popular Information uh, in 2018. It's a newsletter dedicated to independent accountability journalism, which he's gonna tell us all about. The newsletter is described as news for people who give a damn, and I think that describes all of us. He provides in-depth information, well-researched articles with no ads and no algorithms to figure out and filter what, what news will reach us. As he describes it, it is unfiltered, unbought, and unbossed. Judd, welcome to the Big Tent. Thank you so much um, for, for inviting me. Um, it's great to speak to this group. It's so uh, wonderful just to know uh, all how many people are out there uh, in the country who really care about what's going on. Sometimes it can seem a little uh, isolated when you're just sitting in front of your laptop uh, writing uh, a newsletter every day, but it's good to know there's people on the other end reading and, and more importantly, people on the other end um, who really care about what's happening and a lot of the topics that I talk about um, in the newsletter. Uh, so I thought what I would start off uh, by doing is give you a little bit of sense of, of who I am and uh, provide kind of a tangible um, example of the kind of uh, reporting uh, and research uh, that I do, why I started um, the newsletter and the, the gap that I think um, needs to be filled. Uh, in our, our media landscape. And it, it kind of speaks directly to, I think, what um, this group is about, which is how do you actually have an impact and create change? And that, that's primarily what motivates me. Um, as was mentioned in the um, introduction, you know, I, I, I have a somewhat varied career up until when I started this. I uh, went to law school uh, I'm not sure why. Uh, I, did, I did end up practicing law for a couple of years, but I've spent most of my career in politics and in, in media. I uh, joined um, a progressive think tank in DC called the Center for American Progress. When I was there, uh, this was in the early 2000s, uh, blogs uh, were a big thing. And so I got very interested in this new way of communicating. I eventually launched uh, what initially started as um, the center's own blog called Think Progress. It really grew into a media um, website and I really became fascinated with how information research sort of played into the political process and impacted the political process. I took a detour along the way. I went uh, and worked um, for Hillary Clinton in her 2008 campaign. Um, as you might recall, she did not win, uh, but it was a very interesting campaign um, and really gave me even more insight into how things work because it was such an intense media atmosphere. It, it really wasn't that long ago, it was about 12 years ago, but people forget just how, um, how focused people were. There were Republicans running, but it was really about 
you know, Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton and, and John Edwards. And that was really the focus of cable news every day. So I, I was in charge of rapid response research, opposition research, and really had to figure out like, how do you, what happens when you take something and inject it into the cycle? How does it get kind of chewed up, spit out, and, and then presented to the public um, by the media? So anyway, after that, I, uh, I actually ran for office myself in, in 2010. I lost. That was another good experience, though. Uh, I knocked on 10,000 doors. I talked to a lot of people. Um, and it is something that I think back on a lot today because you've got to think about who, who the audience is. And the audience are not people like I run into in DC all the time who are sitting on Twitter all day and are obsessively following the news. There's people with, with kids, with jobs, with, with lives outside of the political conversation. And how do you communicate to them in a way that is empowering and so that uh, af after that i went back to the to the blog that i founded which became much bigger we grew we grew to about 40 people um things were going uh, relatively well but when i was in that process I, I ended up in a situation where i was i had all of a sudden turned into a manager and i wasn't spending my time researching and writing uh, and doing the things that I really enjoyed. I was spending my time managing people, which some people have an immense talent for. And I sort of discovered that I was okay at it, but I, I wasn't doing the things on a day in and day out um, to what I enjoyed. So in 2018, I quit my job. I decided I was going to start this newsletter, Popular Information, and just get back to being my, you know, with just me and the blank page and figuring out how could I um, make an impact. I use a um, platform called Substack, which you may have read about. In 2018, when I told people I was leaving my job to start a newsletter, they had assumed that I had gotten fired uh, and that I had come up with this as some sort of cover story. Uh, now it's become more of a thing. You, you may have heard other journalists. There was recently somebody from uh, you know, one of the columnists from the New York Times quit and started this. It's become a thing, the creator economy. If, if people are interested, we can talk about that a little bit when we get to the Q&A. But, um, you know, I was trying to figure it out and I didn't know uh, if it would work uh, or not. But here's, uh, but just to give you a sense, and I cover a, a, a range of topics, um, but I want to take you through um, in detail, at least one of the topics that's been especially um, an a special a special focus of mine um, in 2021, especially, but also before 2021, uh, and that has been, if you look at one of the big trends uh, in society, it's corporations really trying to publicly embrace a broader set of values other than just making money. Um, and there's a number of reasons for this. I think the primary one really is employee retention. So if you're Google, um, if you are Facebook, if you are GM, if you're any of these companies and you're looking to attract top talent, people who are very talented don't want to work for a ruthless, you know, money grubbing corporate behemoth, they want to work for a place that reflects their values. And also, to a certain extent, consumers are demanding more of this, that they want to purchase things from companies that reflect their values. And so one of the insights that I had as someone who in my time on the Hillary Clinton campaign and previously and subsequently, and as someone who filed, had to file these reports myself, one thing that I knew is the political giving of these companies was not in line with their public statements about what they value and what they think is important and what they stand for. And both on the federal and the state level, 
both the money that's that's donated to politicians, but also just the lobbying prowess. Corporations have a massive impact on the policy direction of the country. So I started um, reporting really the beginning of 2018 started a series of reports about what what I would call the delta between what corporations were saying and what money and how they were spending their money. One of the first topics that I picked up, it, it sort of seems crazy to even think about at this point, was I noticed that major companies like AT&T and others in 2018 were still donating to Steve King. Uh, the, the the former uh, Iowa congressman who, even at that time, was promoting white nationalist talking points. Now, eventually, he just kept on saying more and more outrageous things. He was eventually kicked off his committee by the Republican Party and then lost um, the, his primary election um, this this last uh, this last cycle, but just three years ago, and it wasn't just AT&T, but other major corporations were still actively donating to his campaign. So as a result of that reporting, a couple of corporations did say, uh, yeah, we've thought about it and we are no longer going to be donating to Steve King. So I thought, hmm, this is interesting. If you actually just mention it and just do the research and, and, and get out to my list, at the time my list wasn't even that big because I had only started a few months earlier, but th these corporations will say, hey, uh, actually, we didn't mean to do that and we will not be doing that in the future. So I continued to follow this story. Um, one of the things that I did last summer um, when, of course, we had this groundswell of, um, of activity around uh, racial justice and civil rights, uh, around the George Floyd, the murder of George Floyd. Um, I looked at the corporations who were printed out. If any of you were on Twitter or on social media, there were a lot of these, black, it was a black background, white text um, with these very strong statements about their commitment to civil rights. So I started looking at the corporations that were putting out those black boxes with the right white text and seeing, well, how, how much money have those corporations given to members of Congress that are rated zero by the NAACP? That was the line that I draw. Not just an F, but actually had a zero, um, which means they went against the NAACP's, NAACP's position on every critical vote. And, you know, this, it was a substantial amount of money. Now, none of the corporations really did anything in response to that. You know, I, I asked them for their comments. They had some comments about how they support civil rights. Nobody wanted to make any changes, which is what happens a lot of the time. You know, my job is to get the information out there. Sometimes people decide to make changes. Sometimes people don't. So anyway, continuing on with this reporting, we get to um, we get past the election and the Republican Party or Republicans in Congress start embracing the conspiracy theories that were promoted by President Trump about the election being stolen. So I'm just, as, as everyone else is doing, watching this take place. Uh, Trump will not concede. Um, it was a very, um, it was a very kind of scary time in the country because you know the, the coronavirus is is exploding uh, we're not sure what's going to happen as far as the transition of power um, and eventually uh, you know the electoral college uh, votes that doesn't seem to have any impact but then it became clear that there was a number of members of congress who were planning on voting against certifying the electoral college so based on all the other work that I've done and sort of this idea of, you know, at the same time, there were a lot of companies that were coming out and saying, we support the peaceful transfer of power. And, and in fact, they were going beyond that. They were saying, Joe Biden has won this election and we, we look forward to working with them and we support the transfer of power. So 
you know, this, this, of course, based on all my other work, I'm saying, okay, well, you support the transfer of power. What is your position regarding these members of Congress who are now um, saying that they don't support the peaceful transfer of power, that they're planning on to objecting to the Electoral College? Initially, actually, I looked at a lawsuit that was filed by the state of Texas, and there was a amicus brief that was signed by, I believe, 122 uh, members of the House of representatives. So I sort of took that as, okay, well, if you signed on to that brief, you, you were probably going to vote against the electoral certification. So before, a couple of days before January 6th, um, along with my, I have a research assistant now that I picked up last summer as this thing grew. Um, so we took on a big project, which is to try to see, well, what are the 20, who are the 20 largest corporate contributors? to the members of Congress that are planning to object to the Electoral College. And we want to ask them, will they continue to support these people? Because most of them had said that they support the peaceful transfer of power, that they oppose these myths about voter fraud. So a couple of days before January 6th, we came out with this report. We, we contacted all of the companies uh, beforehand, and we asked them what they were planning on doing, and no one would give us a definitive answer. I mean, no one. It was like crickets about what they were going to do. So then January 6th happens, and I could look right out my window, right over, right over there. I could see everyone, um, you know, uh, marching down the streets with the MAGA flags, and, you know, D.C. was, was quite something that day. Um, and, and, you know, watched with everyone else the attack on the Capitol and what had happened and understanding, obviously, the connection between that and the intention of so many members of Congress to use that to object, uh, to use that day to object to the Electoral College. So then we went back, not to just those 20, but to 144 companies that um, had supported at least one U.S. senator who had objected to the Electoral College certification. And so we sent 144 emails. I think some people make you call, so maybe it wasn't 144 emails, but it was 144 contacts. We got three responses. We got a response from Marriott. We got a response from uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield, and I believe the third one was Commerce Bank. So we put that story out the following Monday, and that is really what created this cascading effect of once it was really, I think it was more Marriott than anyone else. I'm not sure why, but once those three companies came out and said that they would not be donating, they were suspending their contributions to the 147 Republicans who had voted that day to suspend the election, that created a cascading effect where dozens and ultimately hundreds of companies uh, announced that they were cutting off their campaign contributions. So it, I think it shows really what I try to do with the newsletter, which is one, you can't expect an impact all the time and for things to happen right away. You have to take these issues and just dig into them and keep going and keep going and keep going. The other thing that I learned was really the importance of the audience and how they're helping drive change. And um, what, what would happen is as more and more people came out, you know, kind of sector by sector, you could say, okay, well, Marriott has said they're cutting off donations, but I haven't heard from Hilton yet. And I would, you know, put that out either in the newsletter or in a tweet or something like that. And wouldn't you know, like, a, you know, within a few hours, Hilton would have a statement. And then eventually statements were coming in from people that we had never even contacted because they hadn't actually donated in the, in the previous cycle to these senators. So um, it really taught me the power of, of this model. We had obviously seen some impact in the past, but this was a, on, a, on a different scale. And since then, we've really taken that and applied it to 
um, the restrictions on um, voting uh, on voting that we've seen, you know, in Georgia, it's actually in 47 states, but we've seen them most prominently in Georgia, Texas, Arizona, Florida, um, Iowa, um, Montana. Um, but we started with Georgia and looked at who are the corporate, who are the top corporate donors to the sponsors of the legislation in Georgia. Now, eventually they kind of smashed all the bills together into the one bill that passed. Um, but that was another interesting thing because initially we were getting statements, people were responding to us, but they weren't taking a clear stand. Um, but there's a really, you know, Georgia, as, as you might have realized, is extraordinarily well organized. As soon as we put the report out, there were a coalition of civil rights groups who had ads uh, in the newspaper. They were protesting in front of Coca-Cola. They were protesting in front of Delta. They really pushed that into the conversation. And I think the activity that that coalition of civil rights groups did actually did improve the bill from where it started. Where it started, there was, um, you know, it would have banned no excuse absentee voting for everyone. That was eventually taken out. There's a lot of bad stuff that was in the bill um, that ended up staying in there. After the bill was passed, that's when you saw a lot of the companies come out and take a strong stance against it, which was interesting. Uh, I'm not sure what the, the use case was as far as how you're going to influence it, because obviously it was already law. So um, anyway, I hope that gives you a sense of a little bit about like what motivates me. As you can see, I kind of get animated about this. I, I'm, I'm very, um, I feel very lucky to be able to do this work. I'm always looking for like the next idea, the next place to go. Um, and I think that there is a lot of potential or independent media that's not based on any advertisers, that's not based on any algorithms and people can get directly in their email. So you know you're gonna get it. You know, if you if you follow someone on Twitter or on Facebook, you may or may not get them depending on if Twitter or Facebook decides that they're getting engagement, getting enough engagement. That's what always appealed to me about the email newsletter is that um, people were getting it directly and there was no intermediary. So I see that there's a lot of questions coming in. Um, I can, I'm happy to, uh, the organizers of this event should tell me how to do it. I'm happy just to go through some of these questions and, and answer them, um, but it's up to, but I'll, I'll take direction from. Thanks, thanks from. Judd. I'm gonna, uh, a couple of us are going through and if it's okay with you, I'll just feed yeah. the question. Yeah, yeah, perfect. Yeah. Um, first of all, just as an overview, can you tell us um, basically how do you fund yourself? Is it this research that you're doing? Is it literally just through the subscriptions to your newsletter? Do you have, uh, you say on the website, you're not, you know, selling ads, that kind of thing. Just, just curious yep. how the Substack model it's a, it's a hundred percent through people paying either $50 a year or $6 a month. And there's no, you know, there's no foundations, there's no advertisers, there's there's really just those people. There's a, now I'll just say just to, for full disclosure, there's a few people, I do have a thing where you can buy like um, gift subscriptions or donate subscriptions to people, to other people. Um, and so there's a few people who maybe have bought, I don't know, 20 of those, 50 of those, something like that. So there's a few people who are slight, you know, who have, who, have, who are contributing more than fifty dollars, but it's but it's really just those fifty dollar or six dollar things. And I think that's really important because it creates really true independence. Because if you have someone who's giving you, you know, if I was if I had someone who's giving me a million dollars, they might be a good, you know, that might be a, a, a very good person. We might be aligned, but I'd have to make sure that I'm not writing anything that makes that person too upset or or I might be lose all my money. Um, here, I can make people upset, and some people do get upset by things that I write, but, you know, unless I'm making a huge percentage of the people upset all at once, I'm, I'm okay. So I think it's a good model. Right. Um, our friend Jessica Craven, who um, recommended you to us, thank you, Jessica, has, is asking about the fairness doctrine, whether or not that's something that can be resurrected, whether you think it should be resurrected, 
or not? You know, uh, re relating to relating to media and 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 p and time, uh, you know, space and media. Yeah. I think it would be difficult um, to do that. Um, uh, it'd be difficult to maybe get it past the Supreme Court at this point with the current uh, with the current uh, makeup of the Supreme Court. But I do think that the question itself, I think, speaks to a larger issue. And maybe why someone like myself, who's a, who's a small, you know, uh, who has relatively few resources, can find space to, to make an impact, because we do have a relatively uh, narrow um, conception of, of what media is and what kind of content and voices that we deem newsworthy. And it really wasn't so long ago that we had sort of a much more vibrant space in news media. One of the things before I got started, um, and, and maybe some of you have heard of this name, I.F. Stone, who wrote the I.F. Stone Weekly, um, you know, in the, uh, I believe it was, you know, 50s, 60s, 70s, which was the same model. It was, it was an independent, you know, he, he was mailing it out. There was no, no email, obviously, he was mailing it out. But, you know, he took a whole different perspective, independent perspective, and had some of the most kind of trenchant reporting on the Vietnam War. So I do think that getting independent perspectives, new ideas about what's important, what's not important. You know, I think the whole idea of corporate donations uh, for a lot of traditional media outlets, they're just sort of like, you know, these companies, they give to both sides. This is how politics works. OK, and to a certain extent, they're right. But I just decided, well, I was going to take a different perspective on this and say, hey, you gave to this politician. I want to hear from you now about what they said. So I do think, you know, there's there's some structural problems. I don't know if the fairness doctrine is going to be the answer to them, but I but I do understand where the question is coming from. Right. Um, so we've had uh, speakers. We actually have not had sleeping giants, but we had um, Shannon Coulter from Grab Your Wallet come and talk to us, kind of about what it is that we can do to impact corporate behavior. Is that, are you familiar with those groups? Is that something that you have an opinion on, what, what an activist might do? Yeah, I am familiar with those groups. I, and I think they do, I think many of them, you know, without, without sort of like endorsing one over the other or whatever, I think many of them do good work. It's, and I'm happy to speak about it. It's slightly outside of the scope of what I do in the newsletter. You know, one of the things I know is that activism, as, as you, as the members of this group, you know, probably know, activism is difficult. Um, and, and there's a real um, strategy to it. There's, there's all sorts of considerations, and that's somewhat outside of my expertise. So I try to stay, you know, provide people with the information, and then I let the activists go to work, and, and they do a great job. I mean, that's, that's what happened. I was sort of describing that in Georgia. You know, I put out this this report and they just took it and they knew like exactly what to do with it. But I do think that, um, you know, just from my perspective, there are ways that individual people um, can make a difference uh, in this. Um, and it depends on, you know, what you are interested in. I think if you are a customer of one of these companies and you, you know, send them a letter or an email, that gets noted, you know, and it doesn't take that many for it to get moved up the food chain. Um, I sort of learned this, you know, my first job in politics was uh, I was an intern um, for Elijah Cummings, who actually recently passed away, but he was from my home state of Maryland. And one of my um, jobs was just to sort through the mail. And I remember thinking, well, you know, the rule was if five people wrote on, a, on this on the same topic, it got put in a memo and got sent to the member of Congress. And I was like, wow, you can actually like get the attention of the member of Congress with five letters. And I think, you know, it might take a few more than five at this point, but I think you can you can get the attention of these companies with not that many communications. If you're on social media, all of the companies have very elaborate um, system set up to measure the sentiment on social media. So, you know, if you, if, and I think that's what drives a lot of the action too, because I'm, I'm active on Twitter. My Twitter account interfaces with the newsletter and kind of supports it. And sometimes I'll do kind of iterative reporting. 
And if people start tweeting about the, the content, that moves the sentiment meter and it increases the chances that companies will have, you know, a substantive, um, a substantive response. The an even bigger impact are the employees. So if you know someone who's an employee or if you are an employee, I mean, that's where companies are really very sensitive. Uh, I saw this play out with Microsoft. Um, after January 6th, Microsoft moved to a position where they were suspending all of their political donations for an indefinite period of time, which was kind of a it was, a, it was an attempt at neutrality. You know, that's where the companies were going who were just trying to stay out of it. But it was really the, and I started hearing from them, the employees at Microsoft demanding more from the company and saying, you know, we want you to take a firmer stand that eventually Microsoft moved to a position where they were not gonna fund the 147 members who objected the election and they weren't going to do it for two years, which is at least two years, which is a much stronger position, but it was really driven by the employees in the company because they can't afford to lose, you know, engineers and all of the other experts that they have, like that's their most valuable um, asset. So um, I think that's another place. So I think there's a lot of, I think there's a lot of levers um, that, that can be, um, that can be pulled. And um, I think it's important because one thing I've seen, you know, on the other side, and you saw this play out in Georgia, is that the people on the other side of these issues are really trying to push corporations the other way, right? Like after, after the bill was passed in Georgia, Delta came out with a very strong statement saying that they were opposed to the bill. But then the, the Georgia House passed legislation through the house it wasn't ultimately taken up by the senate but they passed it through the house taking away a big tax break and they were very clear that this was in retribution for making this stance so they need to know that they're getting something out of this or they're or they're not going to be or they're not going to be doing it right great that's and that's a great point and something that we haven't thought about or had anyone speak to us about before about the employee impact on corporations we've talked a lot about what consumers can do. Um, yeah. There are a lot of questions about whether you're gonna keep on this topic and keep following up on corporate pledges. And I thought maybe you might give us a little brief summary of, um, you wrote today, I think this morning about the Chamber of Commerce and how that uh, impacts corporate giving or how corporations can kind of slide under the radar in their giving through Give yeah, time. I can talk about that. And also, I'm going to drop a link um, into the chat, too, to give you my latest um, update that I, I published, uh, I guess it was, um, you know, around a couple of weeks ago. So I think the short answer is, yes, I'm very committed to continuing to follow up with corporations. Um, we are right now, you know, corporations made these pledges. They made them in January for the most part. Um, we're at the very beginning of the cycle. We're at the 2022 cycle. It's beginning of 2021. Most corporations don't give that much money right now anyway, because most, if you're running for Congress, even if you're running for Senate, you know, there aren't, you, if you turn on your TV, you're not gonna run into many, you know, ads for someone running for US Senate, no matter where you live in the country, even places that will ultimately have very, uh, engaged campaigns. So just saying we're going to suspend for you know any amount of time doesn't really mean that much. What it'll start to become more meaningful when we get towards the end of this year and then of course into next year. So I'm going to keep following it. But I have been following it. If you can you can see from that link, I look through all of the FEC reports uh, that were filed. We've got our first real substantive look on April 15th, because that was the first time that all the members of Congress had to file. You know, this is, it's an off year, so you only get it once a quarter. You know, you eventually we'll start to get these things once a month. Um, and, and for the PACs, it's even more, uh, it can be even, some of them file monthly, but some of them only file twice during the course of this year. Um, and so what we've seen so far is that most companies have stood by their pledges, but 
and I point these out in detail, like which companies have gone back on it, we do have a few companies that are already backsliding. Toyota was probably the biggest one. Um, there are a few others that I noted in my piece, but you know, those are a few out of hundreds. And actually one thing that I learned was that you had about 170 companies making public commitments, but there are you know, 1,100 corporate PACs. So most people, you know, most of them you've never heard of, but most of them also weren't making statements, but only a few dozen corporate PACs were really donating to any of the 147 Republican objectors. So actually what we learned at April 15th was that this was a far broader phenomenon than even we learned from those public statements. What I wrote about today um, that Emily mentioned was, is the role of the Chamber of Commerce um, in kind of driving and really serving as a shield for corporate action. Um, one thing that um, the Chamber of Commerce did in March, they initially were fairly supportive of companies that were cutting off donations, but then in March they came out with a, a memo that said, um, actually, we don't think it's appropriate for corporations to cut off funding just because of this vote. Um, and actually, Toyota, as I mentioned in my piece, essentially copied that word for word in their response, explaining why they were doing that. So the Chamber of Commerce is a very important role. And what's interesting is we, on the voting side, we have a bunch of corporations that we now see who are signing letters saying that they're supporting voting rights and are against these voter suppression laws. But the Chamber of Commerce, who's the trade association that represents them, that spends $80 million or plus to um, impact federal policy has come out against um, S1 and HR1, the For the People Act, that would provide, you know, that would have, you know, guaranteed two weeks of early voting, um, guaranteed automatic voter registration, would, would essentially shut down a lot of these state efforts. Corporations really through the Chamber of Commerce are, are moving the other way. So, you know, there's a lot to keep track of, um, but I'm gonna do my best to do it. I've, I've invested in some, some research tools that I think makes it a little easier, especially at the state level, but yeah, I'm gonna keep on, I'm gonna keep track of it. Um, what, what other stories are you following, uh, Judd? And what do, you, what do you think are going to be the big stories before 2022? So much. I mean, one of the one of the big things, in, and you know, I haven't really gotten into this in my newsletter, but it's going to be a big deal, and it goes to these democracy issues is redistricting. You know, we we learned about we finally got the at least the preliminary census numbers. They haven't gotten down to the the real details that they need to draw the districts, but that process has a huge impact. Um, you know, one of the things, of course, that like HR one and S one would do would be to require those to those lines to be drawn. Um, in a non by a nonpartisan commission. So just in whatever ways it made sense geographically. Um, what's going to happen now, of course, is that the legislators legislatures are going to draw them for partisan purposes and it can it can dilute people's um, people's votes. Um, some other issues um, that I'm interested in that I think is going to be a big deal. One thing that I, I'm concerned about that I think is coming, um, is a we've had a how we've had an eviction moratorium um, for the length of this pandemic um, that ends on June first, um, and a lot of times the way these evictions moratoriums work, it doesn't forgive the rent that is due. It just prevents you from being evicted for for non-payment. So once it's so once it's released. You know, you're going to have people who owe a lot of money, um, especially people who were in industries that really haven't yet, you know, fully fully recovered. Um, and so I'm I'm interested in that. I've been covering it um, uh, on and off. You know, another thing that I, I became interested in, especially at the beginning of the pandemic, um, is 
is paid sick leave. You know, we still live in a country that doesn't have, you can have a job and you don't get any paid sick leave. Um, th there's been a few, you know, there, there was some movement on that. Um, but I, I do think that that whole process and how we treat, you know, I think one thing that we've learned is that is, is what jobs are considered essential. And I think for, for the most part, they're, they're jobs that we kind of overlooked and devalued and, and will there be any systemic changes to the way in which people in those positions uh, are treated because you know you could and you you may have seen some of these reports the the corporations overall and um, people who are doing well actually did quite well during the pandemic they've increased their wealth um, you know how can we create a you know at least somewhat more equitable society where where people just have the support that they need to, to, to take care of themselves and their family. I think one thing we, we maybe have learned is that our health is interconnected. That just because I have good health care and I'm not sick, uh, it doesn't necessarily, you know, that if someone else does not have that, those types of protections, that also impacts me. So anyway, there, there's so many things. I, I could go, go on and I'm gonna cut myself off there. Uh, but but yeah, I'm right. I'm looking out for lots of stuff, and I also just am, I'm interested in in everything that's that's happening, and so I'm always on the lookout for new stories. Previously, I've done a lot of reporting on social media networks, you know, kind of before all of this, um, you know, rioting at the Capitol and such, um, and a lot of like Facebook, their policies, misinformation, um, and other sorts of other sorts of things on that platform. Um, I've done a lot of reporting on. Well, that connects someone, um, our friend John Cooper has asked, are you aware of BuzzFeed's report today on Facebook hiding an internal memo from their own employees? Not yeah, really. I mean, that, uh, um, they have some great Facebook you know, reporters who do reporting on Facebook. Um, that was a report that was talking about Facebook's response um, really leading up to the riot and their enforcement of their own policies. Um, I haven't done that line of reporting. I've done some similar reporting on vaccine related issues and their enforcement of kind of anti-vaccine misinformation or, or propaganda. Um, but I think that it's, it's a very important issue and it kind of goes back to one of the reasons why I really like the newsletter format is that when I was when I was producing a website that had advertising, you really had to worry about how each piece of content performed on Facebook. There are so many people on Facebook, and if if you're if you if your revenue is dependent on generating page views, so you can so the advertisers will pay you by the page view. There's no greater source of page views than Facebook, so you've got to kind of create content that works well with Facebook, but that might not always be the content that people that you think is the most important. So one thing that, you know, kind of decoupling from that whole ecosystem allows you to do is just write what you think is important. And so some of the stuff I write does well on Facebook and some of it does it, but I now am, a, am privileged not to have to care about that at all. So that's a good thing. Judd, out of curiosity, um, I mean, I think everyone here is going to check out your newsletter and hopefully subscribe. Um, how could we help you grow your audience? What, like, do, do you grow your audience through Twitter, people seeing you on Twitter, through, we heard you mentioned on uh, one of the latest Lincoln Project podcasts, they uh, called out your research, which was, which was great. Um, I mean, I think all of us here uh, really appreciate in-depth, well-researched journalism. Uh, and journalism like yours, we are all concerned about money in politics, corporate money in politics. Um, and we'd love to bring more viewers to you. Yeah, I mean, I think there's a, there's a, I, I appreciate that. It's a, it's a very kind question. So I start off, I appreciate, I appreciate, I appreciate that. Um, I think there's a lot of ways. I mean, I think, yeah, obviously, um, 
if you're on social media, you know, tweeting about it uh, or posting it on Facebook or whatever platform you like to use. But I think, you know, one of the ways in which the newsletter has grown is just by word of mouth. So, you know, if you like it, uh, tell somebody about it or forward them uh, one of the emails. Um, one of the things that you can, you can mention, and I'll mention here, is that, you know, in the beginning of the pandemic, I was doing a lot of reporting on the treatment of restaurant workers and cable technicians, um, and that was a really important line of, of reporting that, that I was doing, um, and it kind of hit me one day. Prior to that, I had a paywall, so if people paid, they would get four newsletters a week. If people didn't pay, um, they would just get one or two. And but it didn't seem right to put that kind of content behind the hey paywall. So sort of just on a whim one day, I said I, I made an announcement. I said, hey, for the rest of this pandemic, um, everything is going to be free. You can pay for it if you want, but I'm gonna I'm not going to be putting anything behind the paywall. So anyway, here we are. It's now 14 months later. Uh, I, I wasn't aware that the pandemic was going to last 14 months <laughs> at that time, but that's still my model. So anyone can sign up um, for free. You'll get everything. And if you feel like paying for it and want to support it, that's something that you can do. But you won't you're not going to be required uh, uh, to do that. And I'm going to definitely continue with that model as long as we're in the pandemic and it's worked out fine. So I may just continue with that model afterwards, too. Um, but that's the way it works. So I think, yeah, um, social media, uh, tell your friend. I have, if you sign up, I even have like a referral program, which, which kind of just automates the whole process. And if you get people to sign up, I'll send you some stickers or a tote bag or whatever. Love like swag. I've got a whole, we love swag. I've got a, yes. yeah, I've got a whole rigmarole <laughs> there. But yeah, anything you can do to just tell people, you know, and, and for me, it's more important. It's It's less about volume. And it's more about I really want the people who really who really care about this to read it. You know, that's that's really what I think a newsletter is about, as opposed to just a piece of web content. It's like, you know, you really want someone who who is engaged with this work and with the project. And, and I get so many great tips and feedback and all of that. It's really a, a collaborative process between me and, and my readers. Um, and, and I really love that part about it. Fantastic. Judd, uh, really, thank you so much. Um, I think uh, we've all learned a lot and hopefully we'll continue to learn a lot from your fantastic in-depth reporting.